sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Click on the link in the description to start your free trial today. Tesla has been the instigator in the great auto disruption we're currently watching play out. They've brought one of the lowest cost, high performance electric vehicles to market in the Model 3. Proven that owning an EV is not only a viable option, but cheaper to own and operate than a gas car in the long run. In essence, they've been a major disruptor in the automotive industry. I think part of that success stems from how they operate, which is more like a Silicon Valley tech company instead of an automotive company. And other new EV companies may follow that same playbook. And this is where a lot of you will get angry with me again, because yes, they have a lot in common with companies like Apple. And as much as some of you may hate Apple, I really do think Tesla shares many of the same traits. But that comparison also extends to companies like Google too. With Apple announcing their new iPhones just a few days ago, I thought it was worth taking a look at how Tesla's EV disruption has similarities to Apple's smartphone disruption that happened a decade ago. All I ask is that you hold off on the flame war in the comments until you hear me out. And if you still disagree with my assessment at the end, let loose. But before I dive in, take a moment and hit that subscribe button and notification bell so you don't miss out on future videos just like this one. I'm Matt Farrell, welcome to Undecided. Most of the time, product and user experience design is looking at addressing a specific issue, feature, or problem. It's not uncommon to have an answer presented as a solution before you even have addressed what the problem is, or better yet, what the question even is. In holistic product design, you're taking a step back and looking at the full picture, seeing how all the different pieces of the product interact and relate, and seeing how a customer's interactions with your company and your products are affected throughout the experience. Apple is one of the best companies in the world at doing just that. And I can feel the rage growing in some folks out there, but just hear me out. Apple has always been an incredibly secretive company. They try their hardest to prevent any details of products in development from leaking before they're ready to announce. And the vast majority of the time, they're not announcing a product until it's ready to ship immediately or within a few weeks. And there's a couple of good reasons for this. One is surprise and delight. The big reveal of a new product has a wow factor that garners attention. The other reason, which is more important, is that it gives them time to iterate, polish, and think through the full experience of that product. As Steve Jobs is famous for saying, you, When you think about focusing, right, you think, well, focusing is, is saying yes, no. Focusing is about saying no. Focusing is about saying no. And you've got to say no, 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 no. And when you say no, you piss off people. Focus is about saying no. And the result of that focus is gonna be some really great products where the total is much greater than the sum of the parts. And at the Worldwide Developer Conference in 2013, Apple put together a great video reiterating that idea. The entire Apple mantra is stated clearly in the video. The first thing that we ask is what do we want people to feel? And we simplify, we perfect, we start over until everything we touch enhances each life it touches. This is holistic design in a nutshell. Tesla's mantra is centered around first principles thinking, which is about breaking down complicated problems to generate original solutions. Tesla's existence and success can be mapped pretty clearly to that principle, and it's really not that far off from holistic design. Both are beginning with questions rather than answers. Both are about creating your own theories about how to apply those to a better product, experience, or manufacturing technique. Both Apple and Tesla designed their products and operations with full product lifecycle in mind, from manufacturing to disposal. Apple rarely takes parts off the shelf from suppliers. A good example in recent years is how Apple brought processor design in-house. Their A-series of mobile processors are among the fastest available today. And by bringing it in-house, they can custom tailor their silicon to their product features and software needs. Other mobile phone makers are using off-the-shelf parts with features that are meant to cover a broad spectrum of needs. The end result is an iPad Pro that uses less power than a typical laptop, but still beats the performance of a majority of laptops in the market. This comes down to the tight optimization that Apple is able to accomplish between their hardware and their software. Tesla designed their own battery pack and cooling system instead of using third-party suppliers with more generic, ready-made parts. One outcome of that is the Super Bottle which you may have seen Sandy Monroe talk about on Sean Mitchell's recent interview. Well, you pull in all the stuff together. I mean, the, the Super Bottle is a great example yeah. of how 
um, how the normal automotive companies don't work together, and Tesla does. Yeah. So that super bottle crosses many uh, lines that uh, that you can't cross here. I mean, if I'm in charge of engine cooling or battery cooling, I don't want your yeah, I don't want nothing to do with uh, cooling the cabin and and, so, and and yet we've got the motor cooling, the battery cooling, and electronics, and electronics, and the uh, and all all going through one little bottle that's got some clever little um, uh, ball valves that uh, that open and close to make sure that everything's getting heated or everything's being cooled to where it needs to be. That's really, I mean, so I'm taking something that I got a, I would have a pile like this of bits and pieces. And they've got this super bottle. That's, I mean, I, I, we all thought yeah. that was the best thing in the whole damn car. Tesla has also designed their own self-driving computer instead of continuing to use an off-the-shelf system from NVIDIA or another company. This helps to make them the master of their own destiny. Reducing their dependence on a third-party supplier for a core piece of technology means they won't be held back in rolling out a new product or a feature because that supplier's hardware isn't yet capable of what they need it to do. And Tesla is able to tailor the silicon and software to complement each other and achieve incredible efficiencies. Google may have started as a search and ad company, but they've always been an artificial intelligence company under the hood. Using machine learning and algorithms to figure out relationships between websites and content in order to surface the most relevant search query. Or machine learning to put just the right ad in front of the right person at the right time. Google Now parsing through your web history, emails, and calendar to figure out what notifications and reminders to display on your Android phone when you start your day. And right here on YouTube, figuring out what videos you're most likely to be interested in watching with suggestions on your home screen or along the side of videos just like this one. They're an artificial intelligence company through and through. The head of Google Now has said, you wanna pick problems that are hard for humans and easy for machines, not the other way around. It's about making the technology do the heavy lifting for you rather than doing it yourself. But unlike the holistic design approach, Google tends to look at technology and features first and then see if there's a product that can come from those breakthroughs. There's no better example of that than Google Glass. There was a product that had some amazing technology, but if you asked a simple question of the average consumer, what problem does this solve and why do you need it? They'd come up empty. There's a graveyard of half-baked Google products over the past decade that resulted from the technology first, product second mentality. Like Google Buzz, Google Wave, Google Talk, Google Nexus Q, Google Plus, and Allo. And those are just a few. The fail fast, fail often, but always fail forward mentality that drives much of Silicon Valley can bring about rapid change. You learn what works and doesn't work and quickly change direction. How does this tie into Tesla? On the surface, Tesla looks like a car company but they're really an energy company driven by software. They're heavily invested in AI and machine learning to enhance their products, with the obvious one being autopilot and self-driving. Tesla's Autonomy Investor Day event walked everyone through their approach to computer vision and the exponential growth of machine learning systems and autonomous driving. The end result is a product that could make cars an appreciating asset because the car you own could be earning you money as part of a ride-sharing network. So essentially buying a car today is an investment in the future. You're essentially buying, a, a, you're, you're buying, the, 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 I think the most profound thing is that if you buy a Tesla today, I believe you are buying an appreciating asset, not a depreciating asset. They're using machine learning in their energy products too. Tesla developed its own software in-house to monitor, control, and monetize Megapack installations. Autobitter, it's Tesla's machine learning platform for automated energy trading. Tesla customers have already used Autobidder to dispatch more than 100 gigawatt hours of energy in global electricity markets. And just as Tesla vehicles continue to benefit from software updates over time, Megapack continues to improve through a combination of over-the-air and server-side software updates. And that brings me to the constant software updates that Tesla brings to all of their products. Much like Google, Tesla is constantly tweaking and adjusting their systems and features that they put in front of customers. As soon as a feature hits a certain level of readiness, it's rolled out for everyone to start using right away. Apple overturned the music industry with the iPod and iTunes. And then they did it again with the iPhone and the mobile phone market. Steven Sanofsky, the former president of the Windows division at Microsoft, 
wrote a great article in 2014 called The Four Stages of Disruption. Those stages almost read like the stages of grief when it comes to the incumbent being disrupted. And you can see that the pattern fits what we're seeing today in the auto industry. Stage one is the disruption of the incumbent. The disruptor introduces a new product with a distinct point of view. The incumbent discounts the disruptor's product as irrelevant to existing customers. When Apple released the iPhone, the reaction from the phone industry leaders should sound familiar to what we're hearing today. There's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. No chance. Steve Ballmer from Microsoft. We've learned and struggled for a few years here to figure out how to make a decent phone. PC guys are not just going to figure this out. They're not just going to walk in. Ed Colligan from Palm. It's kind of one more entrant into an already very busy space with lots of choice for consumers. But in terms of the sort of sea change for BlackBerry, I would think that's overstating it. Jim Balsillie, BlackBerry. Sound familiar? Like Ford Europe's CEO Stephen Armstrong mocking Tesla for only being able to produce 7,000 cars a week? Or Bob Lutz, former GM CEO, saying that Tesla is heading for the graveyard? And that we all just need to wait for the big auto companies to step in and start producing EVs. Stage two, rapid linear evolution. The disruptor rapidly adds new features and capabilities after gaining traction with early adopters. The incumbent begins to compare their full featured product to the disrupted product to show deficiencies. Tesla has been rapidly improving their manufacturing process to reduce costs, beginning to upgrade their supercharger network to even faster charging speeds, rolling out new features to the fleet which will ultimately culminate in self-driving. Meanwhile, we have companies like Toyota creating ads touting their self-charging electric vehicles, which are also known as hybrid cars, or Lexus trying to hit slow charging times, or BMW's wait or drive ad campaign. Stage three, appealing convergence. The disruptor sees opportunities to acquire a broader customer base by appealing to slow movers. The incumbent considers cramming some element of disruptive features into an existing product line to show that they can keep up with trends. This is the stage I think we're in right now. And I think you could argue that the new Tesla insurance is part of trying to capture the slower adopters. Same with the upgraded supercharger speeds and some of the new supercharger locations. The current cars that Tesla are making can go toe to toe with the competition but they're continuing to push forward with motors that can last 1 million miles. And it's looking like Tesla may be on the cusp of a battery pack that's rated to last 1 million miles too. These kind of advances push an EV from going toe to toe with an internal combustion car to blowing right past them on the cost and maintenance front. This is the kind of thing that will pull in slow movers. And on the side of incumbents, you have pretty much every car company in the world having announced some portion of their fleet moving towards EVs. Most of them 2020 and beyond, even Toyota. Stage four is complete reimagination. New entrants to the market can benefit from all the disruptors product has demonstrated. The incumbent is too late and goes into retreat. At this point, I think we're somewhere around stage three, so I couldn't find any good examples here yet. We're just now starting to see new, from the ground up EVs hitting the market that can compete with Tesla's offerings, like the Porsche Taycan. And we have other entries coming from other new manufacturers like Rivian and Byton. The true reimagination of the industry has yet to take shape, but I'm betting it's autonomous cars. The cars we're seeing made today still resemble traditional cars, but with a different power source. The power of computers and software will completely upend cars as we know them. We'll start to see cars without steering wheels, seating that's tailored to more comfort and entertainment than to operating the vehicle. And with robot taxis, we'll see fewer and fewer people wanting to own a car in the first place. If you'd like to learn more about disruption, check out The Great Courses Plus where you can get access to incredible lectures and courses from top professors from Ivy League and other great universities from around the world. Experts from places like National Geographic, the Smithsonian, and the Culinary Institute of America. You'll have unlimited access to over 11,000 video lectures about anything that interests you, from science, math, history, literature, or even how to cook, play chess, or become a better photographer. In my case, courses like Critical Business Skill for Success, where I learn more about industry disruption, like Netflix's domination of the video rental market and how disruptive innovation is often the hardest to respond to. To support Undecided and get access to The Great Courses Plus, click on the link in the description to start your free trial today. Thanks to Great Courses Plus and to all of you for supporting the channel. Setting aside how you feel about Apple or Google, I think it's pretty clear that Tesla is a technology and energy company. They aren't a car company. They approach producing cars like most technology companies approach running software, including their own manufacturing process and car improvements. They don't have model years on their cars and roll out new features and improvements as they're ready. It's treating hardware improvements like software improvements. Nothing like a traditional car company. 
This is one of the reasons they've been so effective at disrupting the auto industry. The rapid, Google-like approach to development makes them extremely nimble and quick to adapt. Their first principles thinking is leading to a better product, much like Apple's holistic design approach. So okay, you can now re-engage your Apple or Google comparison hatred. What do you think? Do you think Tesla has a lot in common with Apple and Google? Or are there other companies that you think are a closer fit? Jump in the comments and let me know. There are some other ways that you can support the channel too. Check out my SFSF shop for some cool Tesla, SpaceX, Science, and Undecided t-shirts. There's also other links in the description for some great gear and discounts. And as always, an extra big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. Your support is really helping to make these videos possible. Be sure to check out my Patreon page for additional details about joining the crew. If you haven't already, consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell to get alerts when I post new videos. As always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.